All right, guys, welcome back to Breaking the Cycle. I'm Alan Hyde, and I am joined tonight by our producer, Chance. Chance, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Good, good. We were chatting a little bit here uh, about uh, failure to launch uh, before the show started, and Chance and I were kind of chatting about it for a few minutes here, and you were telling me a little bit about just kind of your experience uh, and your group of friends. Is When, when you were sharing that with me, uh, just to get on the same page with you, is that a group of dudes that you hang out with? Is it co-ed? Uh, primarily, yeah, about five to six guys, and I'd say out of the five to six of us, I think two are completely dependent on themselves. Independent, I should say, not okay. dependent on anyone else. Yeah. You ever heard of the uh, 5% rule? No, I haven't. So this is uh, there's a lot of research on this, but back in the day, they would take uh, you know group sample sizes of like 100 men, Mm-hmm. And this is true today for men and women, uh, you know, in the workforce. Right. Um, but when the research started, they would take groups of 100 men and track them from uh, the age of like, let's say, 16, I think was the cut when they started like really getting the workforce through yeah. retirement. Like, right. let's say like 67 on average. Mm-hmm. And uh, what they found through tracking these individuals was that uh, on average, 5% of them by the time of retirement were going to be independent. One percent would be wealthy, right? right? Four percent of them would be independent, doing well, and then something like thirty something percent are deceased, if not more, um, and the rest of them are dependent either on a family member or the state. Okay, All right? And it sounds like that kind of percentage is working it, itself out in your friend group too, huh? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it, it can sound discouraging, right? But what we were talking about before the show is that uh, there seems to be a lot of individuals that are that are out there struggling and, and struggling to piece together really a life, you know, really, you know, Absolutely. let alone passions. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What, what do you think? Because, um, you know, you're a well to do professional. What, what do you think happens in those those situations when you see your friends kind of struggling? Um, I think it's typically issues with jobs, issues with income, that the jobs they're getting, mm. it's not always what they need, and they don't always have <coughs> the extra assistance from a spouse or whatever the case may be. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, it's um, – Sammy was touching on this. Sammy's uh, our producer, and she was, she was touching on, uh, you know, there's – over time, prices have gone up. Right. Yeah. The economy has shifted hugely and and pay hasn't really kept up, yeah, you know, and I'm not an economist. But what I know about that just in my my clinical practice day to day is that people really feel that, yeah. you know, they're really feeling that change. And, and I think it brings up, you know, what I've noticed over a 12 year career in mental health is that it's discouraging for a lot of people. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm never going to sit here and, and get outside of my lane as far as like what needs to happen in the economy and, and what those brilliant minds need to sort out financially. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, but what I what I will say to those who are listening is Chance and I have this conversation is, you know, whatever the outside circumstances are, if if we start to take care of our side of the street, our mental health, you know, there's a lot of hope. Right. And. I think one of the things I notice, especially like in younger generations, I'm curious if you see this too, Chance, is that there's a push on like media and television to like live a lavish lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of people find the hopelessness. It's like, Mm -hmm. oh, well, I'm not keeping up with Mm so-and-so. You know, and we, we've had that concept, especially in our country forever, right? Keeping up with the Joneses. Right. Right. But now we've got access to Joneses in all <laughs> kinds of areas. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And, and the one we're not looking at anymore, the person who lives down the street, we're looking at like Kim Kardashian. Right. You know, Kanye West. Right. Right. And we're, you know, we're never going to keep up with that. They're yeah. rich and famous. Right. You know, you know, do you ever, uh, you ever feel like sometimes you see those things and think like, uh, man, it would be nice, but you know, kind of a bummer that I don't have those things. You ever feel that way? Um, no, I definitely wasn't raised in that type of lifestyle. So that's never really been something that's been a part of my life. And I kind of appreciate the struggle that I grew up with Mm. because it kind of made me into who I am and the way I think and the way I do things. And yeah. 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 There's something about, um, 
Well, here's a concept that I talk often with clients who are struggling with failure to launch. And I was telling Chance a little bit before the show, I've, I've worked in um, substance use recovery for the, the bulk of my career over the 12 years. And um, one of the things you see in a failure to launch is a lack of resilience. Mm-hmm. You know, like difficult things happen and there's no bounce back. Right. You know, or if the bounce back does happen, it takes a long time. Yeah. All right. And um, I mean, I'm not I'm not really sure what as a society we can do about that. But individually, if you're listening to this kind of stuff and you're even like in a minor way relating to the concept of failure to launch, it's like mm-hmm. you, you got to roll with the punches because life is suffering. Right. You know, and, and that's that's a line uh, it's from my favorite book. It's called The Road Less Traveled by M. Scott Peck. And the first line of the book says, life is suffering. Okay. Right? And I really like that concept because the very next paragraph it states on the very first page says, the point in which we admit and embrace for ourselves that life is suffering is the point in which life isn't suffering anymore. Mm, that's good. What, what, what do you think about that before I delve too deep into that? Um. You think life is suffering? Uh, yeah, I would say so. I mean, constantly we're going through ups and downs, and every time it gets up and we get in a good place, it always seems like something's right around the corner or yeah. quite the opposite. But usually on the opposite side of things, people don't see the good that's coming. But yeah. I like to think that when you are suffering, you always got some good on the other side of that. So Yeah. Yeah, there's there's really something to that. Like <clears throat> in the last couple of shows, we were talking about this as well as like something bigger than ourselves. Right. You know, and and connecting with that really isn't just a platitude. It's not just like, oh, you know, like you go to church and there's some God, right? It, you know, that that's something that a lot of people find solace in. But the yeah. the concept you find it all over the world is believing in something bigger than yourself, bringing a lot of peace to that concept you're touching on. Is like there's hard times, and right. that's a guarantee. But there's good times, and that's also a guarantee. Right. You know. We just don't know what the hard times are going to look like, and we don't know what the good times are going to look like, but we should probably wake up, suit up, and show up, huh? Yeah, for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I think that's any of my friends that Mm -hmm. I know throughout the years who have fallen into the line of failure to launch. It's always some some version of that with respect, right? It's like Mm -hmm. they're either not waking up, you know, and facing the day, they're not suiting up and, and looking for the next opportunities or they're not showing up at all. Right. And, um, I think that, you know, not to pontificate, but that's a big problem in younger generations. I think that's always been a problem for younger generations, but right. we have access to media now and I think we're seeing it everywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. You feel like, um, access to stuff like this media social media has just made those concepts so much more apparent uh definitely i mean it brings out the the good the bad and the ugly it brings everything out of people whether they want to bring those things out or not it's all sides of it are showing i feel like yeah yeah well you know these days everybody's picking up the phone and recording it exactly you know it's like um i'm sure we'd see plenty of it if we were to have attended woodstock back in the day (laughs) yeah absolutely (laughs) But yeah, now it's it's Woodstock in in your living room, and everybody gets a front row seat. <laughs> yeah, no <they're good. laughs> kidding. Yeah. So you know, it's it's interesting from a clinical perspective as well as a therapist. Mm-hmm. Failure to launch is kind of rooted in depression. Okay. And you know, one of the major cornerstones I share with my clients is uh, depression. The non clinical definition is anger towards self. All right, and. When Sammy and I were talking before, you know how uh, I was sharing just kind of like that picture of a dude. Mm -hmm. And and for those listening, like uh, we may all know someone like this where like they have an apartment or they have a house and you go inside and they have no furniture. There's no art on the wall. Maybe it's a small space. Yeah. You know, their television's on the floor. Mm -hmm. They're eating pizza sitting on the floor right in front of the the television. Bare minimums. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, I think we all know some, uh, some people like that. And when I hear those things are taking place, I'm always assessing for levels of depression. Mm-hmm. You know, first place, obviously, in a clinical setting, I'm going to start with is suicidal or homicidal ideations. Okay. And one of the one of the things that doesn't get talked about a whole lot is like, well, why in the beginning would you assess for homicidal ideations, like harming someone else, wanting to kill someone else? Right. Is because there's a lot of anger 
Mm -hmm. and, and depression and a lot of hurt, right? Imagine anger is like a surface emotion and okay. underneath it, if you were to just like remove the lid, mm -hmm. there's hurt, injustice, fear, and real and perceived attacks on the self-esteem, right? You know? and, and all of those things in a boiling pot for, I would say most people lead to an outward manifestation of what that looks like. And for some, it's a failure to launch. Okay. They're so mad at themselves, right? Because they haven't got the job, because they're not able to afford the house, because they lost the car, right? But, but it gets internalized. Right. For, for some, it gets internalized. The picture I gave you before, that's like a lot of dudes externalize it that way. Yeah. You know, um, women do too, but women are really good in, in my, just speaking for my clinical practice, they're really good at internalizing it. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways you'll see it manifest pretty consistently in, in women who are angry and, and depressed is a lot of negative self-talk and shaming, mm -hmm. right? So okay. they, you know, they feel like they're not living up to you know, the standards, you know, and well, we're talking about media. We, we know how unrealistic and ridiculous yeah. those standards are now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We just don't automatically realize, and you and I can speak to this as men, that those standards of like, um, providing and mm -hmm. producing results is also unrealistic these days. Absolutely. Yeah. You relate to some of that? Like um, the, yeah. the concept of it? Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely say so. Yeah, you know, um, it's like that, that joke of, um, you know, people used to be able to pay for a college degree with a McDonald's wage. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And I imagine there's there's some degree of truth to that. Mm -hmm. Pro probably not fully. You know, we'd probably have to get someone from that generation to sit down and talk to us about what finances looked at that time. Yeah. It looked like at that time. But, um, you know one of our Sammy, our buddy was talking about before. It's like there, there was a truth of resilience in those older generations when she was saying like those who were doing it, were doing whatever it took. Right. You know? And, and I think that's true for our generation as well. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. that people who want to better their lives, they're out there doing whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. And I think a, an important seed to plant and for all of us to remember is that when we see someone struggling, it's not just that they're not working hard. You right. know, <clears throat> there's a lot of explanations for it. Depression is a big one. Maybe they're really anxious. I was just talking with a young man today, the last session I had of the day. And, um, you know, he, not to, I, I, I won't break his anonymity, but I'll tell you the right. story he told okay. me. He, uh, he says when he's driving in his car, if he passes somebody who's riding a bicycle, and he, he drives past him and can't see him anymore. Mm -hmm. He gets so anxious and worried that he can't just drive home. He has to go back and check to make sure that person hasn't actually fallen off his bike because he doesn't believe, right, that he didn't hit the guy. Oh, That's wow. how severe his anxiety has gotten. Wow. I'm sure you could imagine how hard it is to sit down and study or get a job when yeah. that level of anxiety is Absolutely. going on. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is an interesting tie in. In, in this segment, we do. Uh, it's called tonight's tool. And I had a gentleman who had reached out and I think it fits well with that story. Uh -huh. uh, his name is Jack out of Southern California. And he wrote in this week between our show and, and, uh, he calls it the, the yellow car okay. uh, tool, yeah. you know, or, or like example. And anytime he has a negative thought, he stops himself, says, Hey, there goes another yellow car. All right. <laughs> okay. And so he assigns that, that negative self-talk or the negative or anxious thought, and he calls it the yellow car and he lets it pass by. Okay. He says, if I have to sit there over and over again and say, there goes the yellow car, that's what I'm going to do. And, uh, you know, similar examples like that. I've seen work with clients a lot, right? right? But calling our awareness to the, to the thought, if you're out there listening, mm -hmm. Whether, whether you relate to failure to launch or you're just having some of these anxious thoughts, calling your awareness to the thought and letting it pass is going to work wonders. It'll keep you in the present moment. It'll help you start to identify patterns, right? And then hopefully over time, take action. Okay. You know, so I thought that was a valuable tool. And if you're listening and you want to submit a tool, uh, go to allenhyde.com. There are plenty of buttons there to click to send an email, all right? And uh, submit your idea for a tool, and, and we'll review it here on the show. 
Chance, what do you think about the yellow car? Um, I think that's a great idea to definitely help you <coughs> to get your mind off of the things that, you know, our minds are always going, going, going. So it's good to stop yeah, and just kind of put a label to the things that's going on. Yeah. You know, I, I, I didn't anticipate um, what, talking about failure to launch that we'd be talking so much about things like depression and anxiety. But it's, pre it's pretty, when we kind of break it down, it's pretty clear to see, like, that's got to be a huge part as to why people live in less than ideal situations okay. right? or yeah. dependent on other people. You, you think that'd be a big factor? Like just uh, hearing some of these things? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do you, and you don't have to go too deep into this if you don't want to, but out of the friends that you were highlighting, do you think some of them kind of struggle with those things? Um, I think it's definitely possible. I yeah. think, we all come from a different background, but we all have a similar experience. So hmm. I think definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, a lot of my friends growing up, you know, there's a few I know who like have really put together a solid life. But I, I come from an area where there's a lot of substance use in mm -hmm. Southern California. Okay. And uh, it's a desert. It's in the middle of nowhere. There's no major industry. You know, basically the biggest thing that's popping off is dirt bikes, and that's fun, but it's like, what else are you going to do with your time? Right. And uh, I think that's another huge, huge aspect of when when we talk about something like failure to launch, failure to put together a string of, like, peaceful moments in your life, substance use is always a cornerstone um, deterrent those things because it just gets so chaotic yeah for sure. and i have a handful of friends where like anxious is all get out you know have a long history of substance use um and it's really you know for for that crowd it's real. it's the ones who have accepted 12-step recovery mm -hmm. who've really put together a life which um which really speaks to kind of like structure okay. you know they have 12 simple steps they follow Right. And mm -hmm. it's a drastic change for them, but it's simple, 12 simple steps. And when they follow it, they put their lives together. And so it's like if you don't have any substance problems, then w simple structure is going to work for you. Mm -hmm. Right. Like we were talking about earlier, wake up, suit up, show up. All mm -hmm. right. So simply setting your alarm right to get up at a decent time in the morning is going to go a long way making sure that that time that you're getting up is very similar to the time that the people in your city are getting up to go to work you know that's a huge step that when i have a client come in, comes in who's really depressed and they're not doing those things mm. and they start to make those shifts and i've worked with lots of clients for years now right and to see where they are now how far they've come and making those little shifts it it can't be stated enough how simple the work is. It's just oftentimes it's drastic changes. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> if you're listening to this, maybe a, a good way to think about it is what simple things, what simple barriers are getting in your way, even if you've got like a peaceful life, you know, even if you're sitting there listening and think like, hey, things are really good for me right now. One way to think about it is, did we lose, you know, there we go, the sound went in and out. Yeah. The one way to think about it is, what's something simple I can do today to take better care of me? Yeah. All right. You know, um, I was telling uh, some of my friends recently uh, a massive step, but a simple one is I went and rescued a dog on Saturday. Oh, okay. And man, having that responsibility and accountability to an animal, it just adds so much yeah, to the does. peace of life yes. yeah do you have a pet yes i actually have two german shepherds and two no chihuahuas way. yes okay yeah, yeah the the dog i rescued is a german shepherd mix. oh that's awesome i love yeah. german shepherds yeah he's a big boy yeah they are <laughs> <laughs> yeah how long have you had your dogs um one is coming up on four years old and the other is, the other german shepherd is his little brother and he's actually one year younger and so he's coming up on three but then our chihuahuas mm -hmm. there. Ooh, they're old. They're one's about ten and one's about eight. Oh wow! Yeah, so yeah. so you got a full house over yeah, there. Yeah, we got a whole house. Yeah, maybe you could speak to as well. It's like you really got to have things in order to bring a pet into the equation, huh? Absolutely. Especially for yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, if if you really, 
I mean, even on top of just the, the feeding and the watering, they mm-hmm. require so much attention and so much love, just like a person does. Yeah. And so, I mean, just today when I left to come to work, my dog was sitting on the couch. He looked all depressed, you know. Yeah. And it's like, I want to help him, but, you know, we have things to do. And so right. they just, I, I give them as much attention as I can, but they just, they're just like humans. They require so much. Yeah. Yeah. Like kids. Yeah, really. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you touch on a, a good point because we, we had kind of touched on this before the show started as well as like, um, you know, showing that attention, giving that support, mm-hmm. you know, there's a limit, right? Yeah. And it's different for dogs, right? Because it's like you took on this commitment and responsibility <laughs> right. Right. the same way when you have a kid up until the point they turn 18, mm-hmm. you know, and that's just the way it is in our culture. Some cultures are different. We got people listening from all over the world. And so some cultures are different, but the yeah. reality is, is like once that child is an adult, it's no longer our job as the adult to provide that unconditional attention. That's their job to provide for themselves, right. which is another aspect of, internally a failure to launch and Mm -hmm. we talk about this a lot in therapy is like the craze over like the last 10 years has been Mm self-love and i like that concept and it is absolutely true but the practicality of it is you know are you taking care of your basic needs right you know if food water shelter is taking care of the basic needs then take a turn to the emotional realm Mm -hmm. and that emotional realm is first and foremost community it's I would say like if you were to create a kind of like a structure of your emotional needs, community is at the at the pinnacle. Mm-hmm. Right. You got to have like minded people who are putting together a life in a way that you respect or that you right. enjoy. All mm-hmm. right. And I imagine you have that. I mean, work in this position and, and building up your life as well. I imagine you have a community of like minded people around yeah, you. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And. You know, for for those, you know, who maybe you were kind of thinking of in your mind that that might be struggling with the failure to launch. Do they struggle with community? Not typically, no? not not in my small group, I wouldn't say so. Hmm. But then again, I mean, what people put up as their, you know, to save face or yeah. what they present to other people is not always everything that's going on in their life. So bingo. Yeah. Yeah. Bingo. And, and I imagine a, a lot of people would probably relate to what you just shared. It's like, I, I don't think, mm-hmm. you know, I don't, I don't think they struggle with community, but it's like the, the only thing I can really s- say to that is like, uh, in the beginning of my work with like my therapist and taking care of my mental health is like, mm-hmm. I would go and, you know, I'd see people at my master's program back in the day when I was first getting started. You know, I had spent some time with my best friend. Uh, I'd go to work and I, I had people around. Mm-hmm. But when I would go home, I was lonely, ah, you okay. know. And uh, I think a big piece, uh, especially those who seek out therapy, it's like you said, they have the the bravado. They have the mask. They have the persona that mm-hmm. they present to the world. But when they're alone and that mask comes off, right there's a constriction right their reality then zooms in and they're trapped right you know and i can only really speak to that because i've experienced it personally matching my insides with my outsides and the way i present myself was Mm -hmm. a process you know takes time yeah 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 i I was that guy i'm six foot five you know i was that guy who was living in a studio apartment that was like 400 square feet if that you know yeah and it's just like and and that was only like five years ago Mm -hmm. you know and i I remember i'd look around that apartment that little studio apartment i was in newport beach california okay and um i'd look around and i had the degrees i had a good job had the income to have a bigger space and i'd come home to this tiny little space and one day i realized when i was talking with my therapist my my living situation is directly reflecting how I had felt inside for so long, Mm. you know, and it took a lot of work to shift out of that. Yeah, for sure. I see that all the time in my clients where, um, you know, I do my sessions on zoom because I still work with California clients and, um, watching them grow in their, their living spaces, you know, has been interesting as, as you watch even their emotional growth kind of match, Right. It's like they grow emotionally and then all of a sudden they're they're taking care of their living spaces better. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think I think in everything you do is a good measure of 
anything you do could be a measure of yeah. how you're really doing or what's really going on with you. Yeah. Yeah. I think about, <clears throat> I have this one client, he's a young dude. He's an actor in LA, wonderful, funniest dude you'd ever want to meet. And, uh, when he first came to me, he was so anxious, dude, like really? everything was a concern and it was, it was represented like, like a piece of art <laughs> in his room. Like it was just clothes over here, food from last week on the oh, floor, man. you know, sh the, he's got like a blanket for shades, but it's kind of fallen off the top <laughs> of the like seal, you know? Right. And, and we would joke about it cause he knew it. Yeah. Right. And that's what I really respect about just human beings in general mm -hmm. is they know, right. When something's not right. Right. But the disconnect, right, especially in society when people talk about it is, well, there's a lack of empathy on a societal level for it, mm -hmm. right? Because it's like, oh, well, that person needs to just put it together. Right. You need to get it together. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what's wrong with that person? Mm -hmm. But the, the disconnect for the person who's actually experiencing the hardship is they know that something's wrong. Mm -hmm. They just don't know what to do. Right. You know? And uh, it depends on how far down that road they are. Mm -hmm. as to how hard that path is going to be. But once people start to get the simple structure, you know, just part of that structure that therapy also provides is like, you're going to tell me how your life is and I'm just going to hold it up and reflect it back. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. I'm not here to give my, op my opinion into your life based on my experience. I'm here to hold up, you know, maybe some clinical perspectives and, you know, some of the psychology behind why these things happen based on what that person tells me. Mm -hmm. And people are really good when, when stuff's reflected back and they see it, yeah. right, from another perspective. It's like, oh, I need to change something. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I've worked with him for years. And not only in his professional life it, has it started to match, but he'll come on. <clears throat> to we we switch to Tuesdays, but when he comes on our sessions on Tuesdays, his room is clean now. He's got like all <laughs> he's an he's an actor and an artist, so okay. he does like painting, right. and he's got like all of his paintings in in a way that he likes it on the wall. The f you can see the floor now, mm. you know, and and yeah, it's it's kind of funny because there's been a lot of professionals in the media realm that talk about cleaning your room, right? Right, but I think the the piece prior to that that gets missed in the general conversation is like if you start taking care of your m mental and emotional well-being mm -hmm. then your physical reality is going to change yeah. truly yeah because like you know you start doing the things that match how you feel which mm -hmm. is kind of what you were saying a minute ago yeah yeah have you felt that in your life like as you've grown and, and just matured over the years that like you know i've as I feel good about myself, my behaviors start to match that. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I can't, I can't really think. <laughs> <laughs> no, For sure. Putting yeah. you on the spot. Right, right. Right. Yeah. And you know, it's, I do that every week and, uh, um, right. yeah. So don't, don't feel bad about that. Okay, you know, yeah. is, these are some deep conversations here. So absolutely. Yeah. When, <sighs> when we're going to start taking care of ourselves, especially in a, um, if you're in a hard up spot, right. Mm -hmm. A difficult situation, you may not be able to afford therapy, find stuff like this mm -hmm. where you can, you know, it's like we we live in the age of podcasts, Absolutely. right? So for those listening, find people who are talking about the concepts and, and take what you like and leave the rest, right? So you may be listening to this. If you were to listen to the whole thing, maybe there's a minute out of the 50 minutes that I'm talking that you relate to. Take that one minute and, and write about it, think about it, put it into action, right? Leave the rest. I think that's what I notice most about working with people is, is they come in and they want to do everything, mm -hmm. right? I want the results and the answers now. And the, the trick of psychology is you already have the answers. You just don't know you have the answers, mm -hmm. right? My job isn't to give you those answers. My job is to help you see that you already know the answers and you're not acting on them. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. It's a trip, right? Yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah. And I see it a lot in dudes, you know, you, dudes are very logical, right? But they also want solution and they want it right now. Right. You, you agree with that? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 And you know, I, I, I often, when I get a new intake, who's a male, that's our, our first barriers. Like, uh, well, I want actionable items, you know, things I can work on now. Right. Mm. Because I don't want to be in therapy forever. 
Yeah. And um, I have a lot of respect for that with any of my clients. I share with them often. You're not, we're not here to keep you in therapy forever. We're here to keep you in therapy as long as you need to be in therapy. And we don't know what that time frame looks like yet, uh-huh. you know? And it comes to a concept that I, I try to implement in my own daily life, which is I need to take life one day at a time. Uh-huh. You know, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. Right? It's kind of like, man, I just, I, I've been mentioning California a lot. I just moved here at the end of last year. Okay. And uh, I, I would have never known other than like the friends that I've made here that there was torn, there was possible tornadoes yeah, yesterday. For sure. And I was like, Oh crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Valley. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was like, man, let me get in my bathtub. But it's like, that's what I'm talking about. It's like, yeah. you never know what tomorrow, like tomorrow there may be tornado warnings again. Who right. knows? Yeah. You know? Right. But it's, it's when people get too far extended outside of that or too far extended back into the past and they're not staying here in the present that we come back to maybe some of those concepts of failure to launch. Mm, okay. It's like down, sad, and depressed about the past or anxious, worried, and fearful of the future and they're not focused right here. Mm, mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. You ever heard of uh, mindfulness? Yeah. Yeah. What What do you know about mindfulness, Chance? Um. Hmm. I mean, my first thought goes to like meditation, yeah. being mindful of your actions, your emotions, just knowing what you're doing, being aware, being acknowledging these things. That's kind of yeah. what I go to. Yeah. Do you Do you have any practices that you turn to? Um. Since I was young, I've always done meditation. Okay. Just sitting down, nothing at all, completely quiet, and then collect yourself within your head. Yeah. And it's actually something, it was taught to me by a good friend of mine, but then when we were in school, we actually had a sit-down meditation group. It wasn't necessarily a class, but ever since then, you know, I always did it myself, and it was just like something I enjoyed, that's something I liked to collect myself but then I saw how much it affected everyone else. So mm. it really pushed me to do more in the way of meditation and mindfulness to try to make myself better in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I like how, you know, it's a simple practice for you. Yeah. You know, just sit down, nothing at all, some quiet time. Mm-hmm. Was that when you were in high school or, or was it a college thing when you started doing that? Or It was definitely in high school. I was probably yeah. around 17, 16 when I got into it. Yeah. <clears throat> but it definitely has continued in my life since then. Was it teachers who implemented that or was it just a group of friends that said, hey, let's give it a shot? It was actually one specific friend. He used to be, uh, I was in band when I was in high school for my okay. freshman year and then I left after that. But he was one of our drum majors, so he was one of the top guys in the band. Yeah. And he meditated all the time and he brought it to us, my group of friends, and we kind of laughed at it at first. We were like, oh, that's funny. Yeah. And then he was like, do it with me. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess we'll try it out. And then as we began to do it more, I was like, oh, this actually has benefits. It's not just something that people are doing right. to kind of say, oh, hey, look what I'm doing to yeah, improve cool. my mindfulness. You know, yeah. I realized there's actually benefits to the things he was doing. And so I right. started to do it myself. Yeah. Yeah, there and there's huge, huge benefits. And, you know, I mean, from when you were 16, 17, you know, it's like I'm sure you've seen those benefits of engaging oh, yeah. in those practices. And you seem like a really calm dude, easy to talk to. You know, it's oh, like yeah. there's a benefit right there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You know, and <clears throat> it's I, th- I think that it's interesting because one of the pieces, you know, as we were kind of getting set up tonight was that like generation conversation and right that's existed since the beginning of time too i imagine back in ancient rome they were talking about shit like that too oh, like yeah. oh you yeah, know those young kids yeah i'm right? starting to get to the age now where I know. i'm seeing the kid the, <laughs> the kids now doing the stuff they do and i have to go ask my younger cousins hey what is this about you know yeah. cause i'm getting to that part where i'm too old for this stuff you know yeah yeah i think it's all always been present you know it's funny my uh my dad does like uh video he he's in mortgage and he'd do these videos he started putting them on tiktok and i and i'm like is that like what the kids do <laughs> is yeah. that what the kids do these days <laughs> yeah yeah for sure yeah but this uh you know the the generational piece is like i i really do think like um somewhere in that millennial to the younger generations there there really has been a big push for mental health Mm -hmm. and understanding of mental health which changes the landscape yeah all right for better and for worse Mm -hmm. right kind of the same way like the classic example we were joking about earlier of like woodstock but like you know the the hippie 
mm-hmm. movement, you know, and, and like the, the late sixties and seventies, right. It's like, um, you know, a lot of really good changes came out of that. Yep. A lot of really bad changes came out of that. Yep. You know, that was really the first time in our country that, um, massive amounts of addiction spiked to levels that our country had never seen before. And we've never really recovered from that. Yeah. That's a massive change that mm-hmm. wasn't good at all but a good change that came out of the 70s was a ton of social movements that changed our country for the better forever yeah you know definitely and it's interesting because we've got a lot of social movements right now that started out in a really really good spot and mm-hmm. are more politicized than ever and and there's a tipping point there you know it's kind of like uh to stay out of anything political, I, I, I maybe look at it more from like a jovial standpoint. It's like whenever the professionals get their little hands in the cookie jar, right. weird shit starts to happen. Yeah. You know, so we don't really know what's going to happen. But what we know is that the generational landscape always changes mm-hmm. and there's going to be good things that come out of it and bad things. The same way, like the pandemic that just happened, mm-hmm. some really, really good things came out of it and some really, really not so good things came out of it. And yeah. we still won't know what those are for another 10 years of like how good were the good things and how bad were the bad things. Right. You know, and, um, <clears throat> cause you know, it's like, well, while we look, look and say like, well, a large percentage of the population um, has a propensity to come together, and that's a pretty good thing that we can yeah. still do that. A lot of people lost their jobs and businesses shut down, which is awful, awful, mm-hmm. right. uh, completely mishandled. You right. know, like the restaurant industry absolutely makes my blood boil. Yeah, It's like you're telling me people can go to Walmart and Target, but they can't go to a restaurant. I, I, I don't understand. I mm-hmm. thought we weren't allowed to be around each other, but I won't digress too much <laughs> right all right lest i i'll need to go talk to my therapist <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> but yeah you know I, i'm definitely at that same place that you were talking about chance where it's like i look at the younger generation and a lot of things i'm like what are you doing yeah for sure um, but i you know i bet the older generations looked at us the same way when we were that oh, age yeah. and and we turned out pretty good yeah you know, as, so. as a generation yeah yeah i agree i think you're a millennial right? yeah i'm 29 yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you and I are right in that, that gap of the millennials. And I don't know about you, man, but being a millennial, when I see other millennials, they're doing pretty darn good. Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and it's funny mm-hmm. because I, I do think that, that term millennial, it, it's gotten a bad rap, that generation, Yeah, you I know, agree. but the generations before us had the same percentages of mishaps, Mm -hmm. right? And I think that's important when we're talking about like the mental health of like something like failure to launch is it's, it's not a generational gap. It's not a generational divide. It's that every, it comes back to that 5% rule. Every generation has people who are going to struggle and, and really struggle to piece it together. And for some, and, and if this is you listening as well, it's like for some being dependent is the best they can do. Yeah. Right. And it doesn't mean that also, if you're listening, it doesn't mean that if you have someone dependent on you, that you have to provide for them. Mm-hmm. That's a choice. Yep. You know, I, I often talk with people where it's like, if you're irritated with somebody depending on you, who's an adult, why are you providing for them? Absolutely. Oh, well, you know, I love them. I, well, I get it. I get it. Right. But where's the prioritization of self, right? Where are you taking care of you? And that, because look, if that person's truly dependent and can't launch at all, the state's going to take care of them at some point. Right. And I don't, I don't necessarily like that either as Mm -hmm. a clinician, you know, because the state isn't going to take very good care of that person's mental health, right. Or their physical health or, or anything of this, of the matter. Yeah. But as, as individuals, when I'm talking with them in a clinical setting, it's like, it's okay to detach, right? It's okay to say, Hey, I can't take care of you anymore. You're an adult. And I understand if you're struggling to take care of yourself, but that's not my responsibility. Yeah. You know, it's especially hard for adult parents, parents with adult children who Mm. are struggling, but it's necessary, especially if you, if you are, if it's causing distress is always the cornerstone, Mm. right? If it's impacting you in your life, if it's impacting your relationship, if it's impacting your relationships with your other kids, if it's impacting your profession, like you're spending a lot of money on it and you can't keep up, you know, 
if it's causing you distress, it's okay to detach, I guess, is ultimately the point. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a bit of a rant there. Huh? I kind of went yeah. off a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's good, though. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but our, our – man, I'll speak for millennials. Our generation is doing all right. Yeah, I think so. Oh, I, yeah. think, I think we've always done all right. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, wh- one way to kind of – wrap on that point is i think every generation is going to do is going to do okay you know but there is going to be a large percentage who don't and Mm -hmm. in today's day and age you're probably going to see them on tiktok (laughs) and those people are probably going to go viral because that's what's popular on those social medias you know so i wouldn't uh i wouldn't lose too much heart you know there's just always going to be a bigger percentage of individuals who are dependent than independent and that's just that's just the way the economy works too. It's kind of the way of the world, mm-hmm. you know, everything sort of centralizes We're we're in a Metroplex, right? It's like, there are a lot more people over there in Fort Worth close to the city and a lot more people over there in Dallas close to the city. Mm-hmm. And as you kind of get out, it's like, we're right smack dab in the middle. So there's still a ton of people here, but as you go out either way, there's less and less and less people, especially here in Texas. It's oh, like yeah. all of a sudden it's just cows. Yeah, when you're outside <laughs> of the city, it's nothing. Yeah. And so you, you see that on even a population level. You know, things get centralized. Economics get centralized. Money, right? Mental health gets centralized. Physical health gets centralized. The call to action for you listening and, and for me as well as Chance is – if I want that, right, if, if I want to live an independent life, if I want to live a healthy life, uh, I always put this to my clients as like a life worth living, right, mm-hmm. that you're excited sometimes to get up for. Right. Not all the time, right? Right. I love my life, but I'm not excited all the time to get up. Some <laughs> right. days I'm like, dude, fuck, this sucks. <laughs> <You> don't always <laughs> want to go to work and do everything, yeah. right? Yeah. But if you got that sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to do all right. Yeah. You know, and if you don't have that right now, I would say that's a good place to start. You know, it's like get out there and find something you're passionate about or or at least don't hate, you know. And yeah. um, if you're in a position with work where I need the income, but I hate my job, then find a hobby that you don't hate. You know, if you got to if if you're in that kind of a space and you got a little bit of extra cash flow and you don't have a pet get a plant first make sure you can keep that plant alive then go get a pet i've heard that before <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah you know and, and that's a good indicator too because it's like um how well are you taking care of yourself enough to take care of another living thing and a good right. way to start is a plant because if it dies <laughs> yeah you know no you, no you got harm some things no to work on though. yeah <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah so you know there's there's a lot of a lot of things you can do mm-hmm. um you're not stuck and it's not hopeless, mm-hmm. you know. Is there anything you'd add to that, Chance? Um, I think we covered it pretty well. Yeah. 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 What words, just in general, what words of encouragement would you give if there were, you know, some people in an older generation or even our generation or younger generation listening, um, words of encouragement to just kind of uh, get them out there, get them moving in the right direction? What, what would you say to somebody? I'd say one of the biggest things in my life and what I've seen in other people is fear. Just don't be scared of it, you know, mm. especially even in this space, audio and things of that realm. Just don't be scared. Go out and live it. And, and it might be crazy at the time. It might be scary at the time, but it's really important to face the things that scare you the most. I feel like and the mm. things that you fear the most. So. Yeah. Yeah. Courage. Mm. Right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think you really encapsulated it at the end because it's like you're going to get into it and realize that you were scared. Yeah. Right. And you had the courage to face it. And if you if you fail, it's like you learned a valuable lesson. Mm. And you learn a lot more than I feel like when it goes right the way you want it to. Yeah. 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 It's like, um, you know, there might have been a time in my like early 20s, like in the beginning when um when we had to make some adjustments with the audio or I would have been like, oh, my God, what's going on? Holy crap. Right. Or, or, you know, now it's like, you know, I've 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 stumbled into so many situations and just showed up like I'm just going to be courageous and just try yeah. that. Like when it was going, down, I was like, whatever, you know, right. It, it is what it is today. We'll sort it out, yeah. you know, and I noticed that about you guys as you were sort. It's like, yeah, we're good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 
you know, there's there's a lot of courage in that when you stick together with people who are just trying things too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we kind of we drifted away from that. We'll maybe talk about this in, in another episode. Mm-hmm. But um, the when when our basic needs of food, water, shelter are met, and then it takes a turn into emotional needs. I went on some kind of rant that took us away from it, but we were talking a little bit about community. Mm-hmm. And in the emotional realms, you're going to run into a need for community, companionship, and a, a sense of, of self, a relationship with self. And some, somewhere in there above all those, when you, when you, it's like I always think about it in the sense of like Power Rangers because I'm a 90s kid. When, the morph, <laughs> when, it, when it morphs together, right. you know, when the, when the power sword comes together, uh-huh. you're probably looking at something like a higher power, something yeah. bigger than you. Um, and people are a really, really good way to connect with that. And so... For those who are listening, if you've ever felt like things aren't going your way, you've faced the suffering of life, death, medical illnesses, uh, you know, death of other people, pets, because if you're listening, obviously you haven't experienced the ultimate one yet. Um, But if you've experienced the suffering, I would encourage to, to look to something bigger than yourself. And people are a really, really good way to connect with that people who are doing things they're passionate about people who are trying things and showing up with the courage that chance was was touching on and they'll point you in the direction to something bigger than yourself just watch them in action right it's it's hard not to believe that something else good is happening in the world when you see somebody else taking care of their life and doing something that they love you know or just showing up you know and so there's many many more things we could talk about in those realms but I think we'll kind of wrap tonight there and um, I would encourage you to get out, connect with people. If you're not quite ready to do that, then take some of the other examples that we had talked about tonight, like the yellow car example. You're having some negative thoughts or anxious thoughts. There goes another yellow car, right? Or some of the meditation, right? Something real simple. Find a quiet space like Chance was talking about and just kind of pay some close awareness to your thoughts. And uh, I think if you do those things, you're going to be just fine. That's all we got. We love you guys. Thank you very much for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Chance. You're welcome. Thank you.